Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Scott Weinhold. I'm with the State Department's East Asia and Pacific Media Hub. We're very pleased to have with us today Ambassador Cousin joining us from the FAO meeting in Bangkok. Ambassador Cousin will give some brief remarks on the current meetings and related U.S. policies and then we'll go to Q&A. If you want to ask a question, please press 9-1 on your phone. That will alert us. When you're called on, please state your name, affiliation, and what country you're calling from so that Ambassador Cousin has a context for the, the question. Uh, we have, I think, about 30 minutes, and we'll get to as many of your questions as we can and try our best to move it around so that everybody gets a chance. Uh, this call will be recorded. If you're uncomfortable with that, please disconnect now if you do not wish to be recorded. So with that, uh, I hand it over to Ambassador Cousin. Uh, I won't go into any more introduction than that because, Ambassador, everybody has received your bio already. So please go ahead. Thanks so much. And with that, I won't spend a lot of time on my bio either. Let me just say how pleased I am to be here with you today. Uh, this has been a very interesting opportunity to participate in. The United States was was very uh, appreciative of FAO's uh, initiative in agreeing to host this first of what we believe will be a series of regional and local conferences that provide a space for country policy leaders to come together to discuss short-term responses to the uh, challenges from increasing food prices, but also with a vision towards medium and long-term agricultural de uh, development. The United States is here because we are committed to supporting global food security around the world. And that commitment is not a short-term commitment. We recognize that if we expect to make a difference in the agriculture as a economic development driver for so many of our developing country partners around the world, that we, are, we must and we are required to have a medium to long-term vision. And what that means for us is that we're looking at a sustainable agricultural growth opportunities, agricultural research, as well as the use of new technologies to increase the harvest yield. Um, and we cannot forget the importance of improved trade policies that access local, regional, and global markets for developing countries. And looking at what, with a, with a commitment to those medium and long term activities, we also need to help and support countries as they work on a daily basis to protect and to um, respond to the concerns in their marketplaces from short term challenges to increasing prices. So we've been very pleased with the participation of countries, of this, of countries at this first regional conference because what's been really, I, I will say, surprising, honestly surprising, is the candor that countries have brought to this discussion, the willingness to provide transparency into their country's policies, not just from the long and medium term, but in the short term. So with that, I am prepared to answer questions because I know we have a number of reporters on the call who have probably very specific questions that they'd like to ask, and I want to give the opportunity for uh, time to respond to those questions. Okay, thank you. I think we're going to uh, first to our uh, reporter joining from South Korea. Um. Hi, thank you for the chance. I'm from Korea, Duma Daily Newspaper. Here I would like to ask about North Korean food issue. Um, do you think this possible second global food crisis would affect North Korea as well? If so, how seriously would North Korea be affected? And how is the situation in North Korea's food and nutrition problem, according to the assessment that the WFP and FAO have jointly conducted recently? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, as you know, the United States was a donor and supporter for the DPRK's food security problems back in 2008. We discontinued that problem because of that we discontinued our, our contribution to DPRK in 2008 because unfortunately 
the, the government was in non-compliance with our agreed monitoring for the distribution of, of the food aid. I understand uh, that and, and recognize the, re, the results from the WFP and FAO assessment that was done back in December, that there are continuing problems, and the United States is, uh, as government and our people in our country are very concerned about the people of North Korea. However, we, uh, con we believe that any future support for DPRK will be based upon a number of factors. The first is an assessment of the need. There is a, a, an assessment team from the United Nations as well that includes FAO, WFP, as well as I believe UNICEF on the ground that is just finishing an assessment this week. We look forward to the outcome from the results of that assessment, but that assessment alone will not determine whether or not we pro provide future assistance to, DP to the DPRK. It will be determined by the results from that assessment as well as the priority of the DPRK's needs in comparison to other programs that we have around the globe, that we support around the globe. And finally, to the DPRK's commitment to a, a um, process for monitoring that the global community can support. Okay, um, can I ask one more question? Uh, so if those kind of things are guaranteed, uh, when do you think the U.S. government with FAO and WFP would resume food aid to North Korea, and how much would be the total volume of the aid? Uh, that would be a purely, I could only give you a purely speculative answer at this point that I am not prepared or able to provide. I can say that we look forward to the results of the assessment and uh, engaging in future conversations with all of our partners regarding the DPRK. Thank you. Okay, uh, for our next question, we're going to go to uh, Australia. Karen Snowden, go ahead, please. Thanks very much. It's Karen here. I've got lots of questions, but I'll, I'll restrict myself to um, this for now. Given the tensions in the Middle East and in Africa, this is a two-part question. I wonder if you'd deal with it. Um, if higher oil prices occur, get much higher and presumably push already high food prices even higher, um, what, what's the, the likely immediate uh, concerns about that? And given that if your answer is positive in that sense, but, oh, in the positive, does that mean, you know, that the U.S. is particularly concerned about um, tensions in this area possibly leading to uh, oil shortages and a, and a serious um, oil price spike? Uh, uh, thank you very much for that question. And while we are very – while we continue to monitor – both the oil prices and the food prices. I am not prepared to suggest any particular specific action that the government, that our government would um, would take in response to uh, increased oil prices or food prices in any particular country. The, the the importance of the regional conference that we're having this week is because there's a recognition that global uh, price increases affect different countries as well as different regions in, in very uh, diverse ways. We have witnessed in the last several months uh, increased food prices related to wheat and corn, some in sugar as well in palm oil. We are in Southeast Asia here in Bangkok having conversations where rice prices to date have not been significantly uh, detrimentally impacted by the global increase in food prices. As a result, <coughs> the, the activities in this area have um, – the countries have not made any policy decisions regarding how they would move forward. Now, what we do know is that there are particular policy activities that um, will create uh, a negative impact in, regardless of what country you're in. And those are things like um, embargoes or, um, <clears throat> excuse me, or, or stockpiling, the of, of products, export bans, any of those kinds of activities will exacerbate 
the impact of higher food prices or higher oil prices. And there's a recognition, however, that with transparency between countries, communication between countries about availability of food stocks, as well as targeted support for vulnerable, vulnerable populations, particularly women and children at the, at the country level, that you can avoid the detrimental impacts of increased food prices and increased oil prices to those populations. I don't know how we're going to time, but may I have another question? Let's, let's try to go around. I think we'll have enough time to come back to you. Just a reminder to everyone, please uh, hit 9-1 if you have a question, and if you've had a question answered, you can hit 9-1 to get back in the queue. And uh, now let's go to Embassy uh, Beijing. From okay. Hello? Can you know me? Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> Hello? Hello. Uh, my question is, considering the Chinese food market is relatively separated from the world market, how will this kind of round of food price surge affect the Chinese market, especially in the corn and soybean sectors we uh, import a lot from the United States? And how should the two governments work together to deal with the issues? Thank you. Well, the, the issue of how will increased food prices affect the Chinese market is not a question that as a U.S. government official I'm in a position to answer. However, we are very pleased with the continued and increased conversation and communication between the United States government as well as the Chinese government as well as the private sector and the farming um, uh, communities in our two countries. And that increased level of communication is, is a benefit and will positively impact any, um, re, any um, ex access to information that the Chinese community and the Chinese people will require in order to make the right decisions about, the, the, about policies of re affecting their harvest or their, um, their stocks in their country, in your country. Okay, let's go to uh, Indonesia. Okay, my name is Kisan from Indonesia. My question is, what kind of strategies that Indonesian government should take to improve agricultural productivity? Uh, and how can Indonesia help small farmers because they are the people who are really affected? And what about uh, strategy? Uh, given that the impacts of climate change in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. The, as we look at the impacts of climate change, it is very important that we, we uh, in, support increased agricultural research for seeds and other inputs that will increase the yields for farmers that are impacted by climate change. And the United States is very, very supportive of the use of new technologies that provide those opportunities for, for farmers, particularly in places like Indonesia. Okay, um, let's go to Guangzhou. Food of all fuel uh, debate is getting bigger and biofuel is going for the reduction of food production because crop land, crop or, or uh, soybeans are used to produce biofuel. What do you think of this? Excuse me? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I didn't hear the end of your question. Uh, the biofuel is going for the reduction of food production, um, and uh, do you think that's correct? Correct. What the, 
Thank you very much for that question. There, there is an opportunity for farmers to have a diversity of crops, and including um, biofuel, uh, cellulosic crops, as well as food crops. We, the United States, believe that there must be this diversity to ensure that we meet the fuel needs and food needs of countries, and that it is, it is um, the responsibility of the countries to then make the determination about how to diversify and appropriately diversify the crops within their, within their, um, within their country. Okay, let's go to uh, Papua New Guinea. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Veronica and I'm with the National Papua New Guinea. My question is, um, Papua New Guinea being agriculturally a rich country, even though do you think peace will be affected by the global price increase and to what extent? I'm asking this question in light of the recent huge liquefied and naturalized gas project by the developer ExxonMobil currently going on in the country. Well, in, in answer to your question, as well as to the last questioner, let me just start off by saying that food security is a priority initiative. Global food security is a priority initiative of this administration. And ensuring that populations have uh, access to nutritious, quality food is, a, is the first priority as we discuss the issues of agricultural development. Then is the, the issues specifically related to Papua New Guinea and the potential for impact from increased global food prices. Again, that would be a purely speculative response for me to provide, and it would be, I believe, inappropriate. However, what I would like to suggest is that, um, that the, this, this, that's, that's one of the most interesting uh, outcomes of this conference, as I, as I stated earlier, is the sharing of experiences between governments that is occurring here uh, in Bangkok and the, the tools that governments are taking back to their countries that they will then hopefully use as they manage the impact of food prices on their populations. And Papua New Guinea does have a representative here at the conference. Okay, and back to Beijing. Um, as we learned that the U.S. corn export price have a 37% this last June, does the U.S. plan to come up with any solution to ease the pressure, such as using less corn for alternative energy purpose? And on the other hand, uh, soybean price have also surged nearly 50%, particularly because of a strong demand from China. Do you see China's strong soybean demand leading to a potential competition with other countries? Um, so it's being important. Thank you. The U.S. is a is again, and I'm, I'm very proud to serve as the ambassador, of course, to the United, from the United States, and uh, it's been and come from a long line of farmers inside the United States where we are very proud of our, our corn growing uh, uh, capacity in our country. And we are, as you know, a large exporter of corn for food use and not just for biofuel use. And as a result, we continue to see the opportunities in, in both of these crops and do not see them as mutually exclusive or that the, the growth of, of uh, corn for biofuels has been detrimentally impacting to either the U.S. market or to the global market because we have increased the amount of corn that we, that, uh, we harvest for consumption. And not just um, and, for, and not just for biofuels. And that corn that we concern, that we uh, harvest for consumption is not just for our domestic use, but also for the export market. Let's go back to our participant from Seoul.
question about North Korea because it's a very, very serious issue for South Korea, especially when Pyongyang appeals for food aid to all the world, to all Asia, and uh, to every embassy, including U.S. So it is also said that North Korea is saving and stocking the cereals to prepare for the big year in 2012 for its political purpose. So the food situation could be a bit exaggerated. So what do you think about this possibility? And uh, still, do you think the sponsor countries should help DPRK? Again, thank you for that question. I, I did answer the DPRK question, but I will expound upon it a bit just to simply say that um, the, the just as the, the people of the United States are concerned about any hungry people uh, around the world, that includes those who are who suffer from hunger in the DPRK, and that is not just an issue of concern for the United States, but for the entire global community. We look forward to the assessment and the report from that assessment that is uh, being completed, as a matter of fact, today. As I know, uh, other donor countries who are interested in assisting the vulnerable populations in DPRK are also looking forward to the results from, from that assessment. And at this time, uh, any additional comments would, um, would, would be premature in advance of receiving the, uh, the information from that assessment. Okay, and we'll go back to uh, Karen Snowden in Australia. Thank you. Um, I, I've got a question looking at the longer term. And um, given that the FAO has estimated that uh, food production will have to increase by 70% to meet increasing demand by 2050, and given that uh, a lot of farmland is being lost to urbanisation in lots of countries around the world, particularly in Asia, and given, sorry about this, given that uh, you know, some of the worst hunger is in Africa where the poorest farmers are, how, what sort of concrete... Um, solutions are being put forward at places like this conference uh, to try to meet that 70% increase in production. You know, are, are there real strategies being talked about, like cheaper fertilisers for African farmers, for example, land use policies in Asia, those sorts of things? Would you respond to that, please? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that question. As you were articulating the different issues and and your and some suggested uh, or your thoughts about ideas that you were hoping we might have discussed here at the conference, I was sitting here shaking my head and nodding in agreement that all of those are issues that have been discussed here at the conference and that are being discussed in forums, whether they're regional or global, about how do we as a global community continue to meet, move forward to meet what we all know will be an increased need for um, in, uh, an increased agricultural need as the population continues to grow to, in, in, in towards the year 2050. The, the exciting um, the exciting outcome from Africa right now is that for the first, for the, for the second time uh, in the last uh, several years, the Africa, Southern Africa in particular, is, is particular is experiencing a bumper crop. While there are challenges in other parts of the world, the harvest in, the, in that part of Africa has been, um, those, those yields have increased dramatically. And that is a direct result of the investments that are being made in the, in, in the inputs of um, better seeds, better fertilizers, as well as better post-harvest uh, post practices that are resulting in more value to the farmers for the crops that they're growing. So more yields, more value. That's exactly what we need to see here in Asia, are those types of long-term solutions that have been identified by the global community as the way forward to meet this increased need, but that require not just investment 
at the country level, but partnerships from governments like the United States. And we're very pleased that this administration supports those partnerships and our implementation plan for those par- to support that, those partnerships is a program called Feed the Future, where we're working with a number of these con- con- countries around the globe to support them in incl- increasing the entire value chain for agricultural development. That includes seeds in the ground, as well as post-harvest practices, storage facilities, uh, increased storage, co- providing increased storage capacity, um, and uh, uh, building and supporting additional infrastructure development, increased technical capacity for countries, as well as creating the marketing systems and trading systems that countries need to support a sustainable agricultural development system that not only provides the food security that a country needs, but also increases the economic uh, the economic opportunities for those who are directly affected by the agriculture sector inside their countries. Okay, let's go to a caller here in Tokyo. Actually, the ambassador answered my question, so I will pass. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, let's go to back to Beijing. Ms. Chen from Taishin Media, I have two questions. First, uh, what is the biggest argument in the Bangkok conference? And second, uh, are the global food price uh, likely to remain close to record high? Will this year be any better? Thank you. In fact, there has been a little, if any, disagreement here at the conference. In fact, what we have seen is an enormous amount of consensus across countries for the need to communicate, to provide the trans, to ensure the transparency that is required by governments to support the implementation of good policies in the short term that will support the protection of their they're each country's citizens as the, we continue to respond to increases in food prices. The, whether food prices will continue to increase, there are people who are much smarter than me, who are spending a great deal of time reviewing all of the data and analysis from the harvest around the world to determine the impact of those harvests and changing weather patterns on the prices for the next several months, and I, 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 as you, continue to look forward to that data as it is released by organizations and institutions like FAO. Okay, we're coming to the end of our 30 minutes, so let's do one last question uh, to back to Guangzhou. Hi, the question is, uh, do you think uh, if the, uh, the, the food price rise will continue for a relatively long time, and uh, when do you expect if the food price the rise will end? Thank you. Excuse me? The, 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 the challenge of, of food prices will, will, we will continue to have a volatility in food prices because of issues related to increasing population as well as stock availability and harvest across different countries at the global level. But we, what we recognize and what countries are talking about here at this conference is how do you respond to that increased price volatility. And you respond to that increased price volatility by impacting the long-term um, the, the long-term programs and processes that provide for the for an increase in the agricultural development sector at country level. Countries must pay attention to the agriculture sector. The reality is that over the 15 years ago that countries began to look to other drivers for economic development in their for their economy for their economies. However, there's a recognition that in order to meet the the demands of growing populations and to avoid the the negative impacts from price volatilities, that countries must increase uh, their agricultural investments 
and that includes increasing um, the the investment in research as well as in quality inputs, providing technical capacity for farmers so that farmers are recognizing that they have opportunities to not just feed their families but to assist in feeding their community and ultimately their country, the region, and the world. And by doing that, we will then provide the tools that are necessary for any government to support the economic growth of their country through increased agricultural productivity. Thank you very much, Ambassador Cousin, for joining us today, and thank you to, for all of our participants. And we hope we uh, have you on another program of ours very soon. Goodbye. Sure.